Three weeks in October 2002, a time seared into our memories. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid, I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Absolute horror. This isn't supposed to happen in a community like this. As two murderous snipers encircled the Washington, D.C. area, a time when we all realized that our life or death in those 22 days was just a matter of chance. Welcome back to Three Weeks of Hell, the D.C. Snipers. I'm Bob Barnard, and this is episode four of our podcast, looking back on the D.C. Snipers who terrorized the D.C. region in a wider sense uh, 20 years ago in October of 2002. Crazy time. That's right, and I'm Melanie Alnwick. So in our last episode, if you joined us, we really kind of drilled down to that day, that October 3rd, when we all realized that nothing about this was normal. And uh, now we're gonna take you into really what was the second week, the beginning of the second week of all of this. And everybody was kind of hunkered down, not sure what was going on. and. While that was happening, there was a mom and her kids in Prince George's County. They were also anxiously watching the news. But Mildred Muhammad had another reason to try to stay low, and that was her ex-husband, John Allen Muhammad. Mildred Muhammad agreed to sit down with me for an unedited discussion. I really want to know who was Mildred Muhammad back in 2002, and who is Mildred Muhammad today? How has that, this experience changed you? Mildred Muhammad in 2002 had just gotten her children back from being kidnapped for 18 months. I went through an emergency custody hearing in September of 2001 where we had to go to court for the judge to decide who would get custody of our children. And since I had done my paperwork, pro se, which meant I did it myself. I got my divorce, I got my writ of habeas corpus, which meant anywhere they found my children, they needed to pick them up and bring them back to me. Mildred had last seen her children in March of 2000. They were living in Tacoma, Washington. She and John separated a few months earlier, and he called to tell her he was taking the children shopping. They were actually boarding a plane for Antigua. Mildred says that after the children were legally returned to her, it was clear she needed to get away. I had divorced John October 6, 2000, and I had all of my paperwork in court. The judge awarded me custody of the children. He had to sign over his rights to the children so that they could be delivered to me. In that courtroom, my attorney, my advocate and I went in the hallway to find out where my children were. And while in the hallway, John approached us and we ran down the hallway. He put his hand on the courtroom door, looked at me and said, gotcha. My attorney said, no, we need to leave out of here now. So picking up my children, coming back to the DMV area, September 6, 2001, and we went into hiding. A few days later was September 11th, where all of the airlines were shut down. And so that gave me the opportunity to get to know my children, they get to know me, we enroll them in school, and just try to live a normal life. However, I would still check the rooftops when I left because John was an 84th combat engineer and part of his training was tracking and so I knew that or felt eventually he would find me and I just needed to stay on alert so 2002 was about staying on alert checking the rooftops 
calling my sister when I left her home and when I returned home trying to secure employment for me and my children so that we could get our own place because I was living with my sister at the time. And that is what the first part of 2002 was. So when the shooting started, we were told to look for two Caucasians in a white box truck. So I was looking for that, and I was looking for John too. Everybody was looking for two people, I was looking for three. So we were in fear, just like everybody else, didn't know who it was. It was a very um, unnerving experience for everyone. Mildred's children were 8, 9, and 11 years old when they settled into a modest townhouse in Clinton, Maryland. It was supposed to be a fresh start. It must have been exhausting for you. The hypervigilance, having to constantly worry about John, worry about your children, trying to reconnect with them, being the mom, but also taking care of yourself. Well, taking, my, taking care of myself was the least priority. The highest priority was staying alive. So in order for me to stay alive, I needed to be diligent on making sure that my surroundings were safe. Because nobody believed me when I tried to tell them about John. Law enforcement, nobody. So I was literally on my own trying to secure my own safety and at the same time not alarm my children that my life was in danger. I can't imagine what it's like to be separated from your children for that long, especially when they were so young. I have two myself and I think I would go crazy. I would do anything to try to get them back, but then you did everything you could do. How did you, in this time of exhaustion, of fear, hypervigilance, how did you reconnect with them or try to? Well, I didn't question them on what their experiences were. I needed to, to find someone that would help me to do that. My son was very angry with me. My daughters were happy to be with me. There was a period of adjustment. They had abandonment issues because, my, because their dad, although he took them to Antigua, out of the country, he did not provide for them very well. So from my understanding, he, he was making passports and birth certificates illegally for the citizens of Antigua to come to the United States. He would bring them over, shake their hands and say, welcome to America. And while he was here, he was looking for me. In the meantime, he had our children in Antigua where other people were caring for them, but they were still afraid that he would not come back. So after that experience and getting them back with me, then I had to really assess what would be the, the correct procedure to help them to process where they've been and where they are. And so going to work, I would say I'll be home at five. Well, if I came home at 5.15 and I walked through the door, then they were hysterical. So I had to, I had to start giving a range. So I get off at five, I'll be home between 5.30 and six, right? Because although I worked at Southern Maryland Hospital at that time, I didn't have friends. I didn't have anyone to, anyone to confide in because for me, 
I was saving their life. Because anybody that was associated with me, I felt I was putting their life in danger because they weren't aware that someone was out there trying to kill me. And you think some of that were the, the lingering effects of the years of emotional abuse that you had suffered? It's not a lingering effect. He said, you have become my enemy and as my enemy I will kill you. John was a man of his word. He said what he meant and he meant what he said. The fact that I couldn't get anybody else to believe me didn't mean that I was going to negate what he said. So he was going to kill me and he was going to bury me where nobody would be able to find me. So no one else was willing to take my safety into consideration, then I had to do it. And so, I had to take other people's safety who were coming into contact with me. Why do you think nobody believed you? Because they don't ever believe victims who don't have scars. I didn't have a scar. 80% of victims don't have physical scars to prove they're victims. Business people, nurses, doctors, police officers, they could all be victims. But they're not going to tell anybody because as soon as I tell you I'm a victim of domestic violence, your opinion and your, the light that you have in your eye when you see me diminishes. And so now I'm just a pathetic person who allows someone to come into my life to control and abuse me. You could get out of that at any time. No, you can't. But people don't understand that, nor do they want to. That's why victim blaming is at the highest peak whenever something like this come out. When they found, when the community found out <laughs> that I was his ex-wife, so the comments were, you know, if, if you would have stayed with him, he just would have killed you. If you would have stayed on the West Coast, then the people on the East Coast would still be alive. How dare you call you and your children victims when none of you were hurt or killed? And how dare you bring this drama into this quiet community? It was all my fault. That must have been so hurtful. Nope. No, ma'am. Everybody is entitled to their opinions. I don't have to accept them and I don't have to internalize them. And that's where I left it. So no, it wasn't hurtful. Mildred met John Muhammad in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1983. In her first book, she writes that she was a naive 23 year old who wanted to meet somebody to love. She recalled John had a beautiful smile and she was impressed with his punctuality for their dates. When she found out John was married, she wanted to end it. They agreed to remain friends as she tutored John in reading. In 1985, John enlisted in the Army and was stationed at Fort Lewis in Tacoma, Washington. After divorcing his wife, John married Mildred in 1988. Take me back to the early years because the, the relationship, your relationship with John changed. And when did you realize that things were changing? When he came back from Desert Storm. He was a different person. As I'm sure you've heard this many times when soldiers return from a war zone, they're not the same person that they were when they left. And so he was, before he was jovial, life of the party, everybody wanted to be around him. When he got back, he was very subdued, isolation, rocking back and forth in a chair. I'd ask him, are you okay? He said, I'm good. He was diagnosed with PTSD, and he was not debriefed. PTSD at that time, there were not a lot of resources available, and any soldier that sought out help for a mental disorder would be flagged, and they would not be promoted. So there are many soldiers that are walking around with PTSD that are in the military that will not go to seek assistance on post, but they will go off post to get the help that they need. What was the point of, uh, at what point did you decide to leave the marriage or was it a mutual breakup? We had a mobile auto repair service 
for a few years where we would go out and fix vehicles. And in, the, in that service, he was having multiple affairs. And so it got to a point where I said, you know what? I want a divorce. He said, well, why do you want a divorce? I said, well, you know, you're acting free. You may as well be free. You don't have to lie to me. You don't have to say you're here when you're there. I am taking myself out of this equation. And that's when it escalated. So he, he moved out, but he still had a key to the house. So he would come in in the middle of the night. I would hear the key going into the door. I would hear him walking down the hallway. I would open my eye to a slither, watch him come in, walk from one side of the bed to the other, lean over to listen to me breathe. He'd stand up and walk out the door. So I called to get the locks changed. He changed the locks, but then he started um, changing my phone number multiple times. Finally was able to get the phone company to put a code on my phone so he wouldn't be able to do that. And um, what, what upset him mostly was he came over to the house and tried to push his way in where I fell back and hit my head on the fireplace. I called the police, he ran. Police came, they asked me to have a restraining order. I said, no, I don't. They gave me the paperwork. I went to the courthouse. It was one sheet of paper with 10 questions. And I was crying uncontrollably because 12 years of marriage, three children, a business, and it's reduced to filling out a restraining order. I completed the restraining order, went to court. The judge said, you know, you really need to get away from this guy. I said, Your Honor, I'm, I'm really trying to do that. And he gave me a lifetime restraining order. So I don't know if they still do that, but I had a lifetime restraining order. But we still had to have visitation with the children. So he came over and he said, we need to talk. Well, my brother was in the house, so I wasn't afraid. And he said, um, so we went in the garage. He said, you're not gonna raise my children by yourself. You have become my enemy, and as my enemy, I will kill you. So not to show fear and to be outdone, I say, well, I've been sleeping with the enemy all this time. What else are you gonna do? He charged at me. I ran to my brother. He left the house. I told my brother, John is going to kill me. He said, John, I'm not going to kill you. He's just playing with you. I never went to my brother again for help. Because when you are a victim of domestic violence and you go to a family member or a friend, a colleague, or somebody that you trust, and you say, he's done, or she, A, B, C, and D to me, and their first response is, well, I don't know that side of them. They've never said anything, I'm done. I'm not talking to you because what you're gonna do is you're gonna go back to him and say, hey, you know, Mildred was saying these things about you and I'm just trying to check. You've just put my life in danger. You just set me up. So that's called the touch test, as a matter of fact. I'm touching with my words what your response would be and if you said something like that, oh, I was just playing. I was just wanting to see what you was going to say. No, I wasn't playing. I know I can't talk to you anymore. So at what point did you come to the D.C. area and what brought you here? What brought me here was my mom. When I was in the shelter, my sister called and said that our mother was sick and she needed help taking care of her. Mildred testified in court that John took everything from her, her children, her home, her health. Coming to help her mother and her sister, she says she got her strength back. After I got all of my paperwork straight, I came to the D.C. area. I filed my restraining order under full faith and credit so that it would have the same power here that it would have in Washington state. I called the FBI when I got here and, and said to them that my children are no longer in the country and I need help because it's a federal offense to take 
your children out of the country when there's a, a, a custody issue. So they came over, I told them what was happening, gave them all of my paperwork. They sent me my paperwork in two weeks and said that it was an ongoing case and they were gonna refer me back to Seattle. I called the agent in Seattle. I told him that I'm running for my life. My children are kidnapped. It's gonna be a headshot because his motto was one shot, one kill to the head. Never leave an enemy behind. And I just need help to find my children. They said, well, Ms. Muhammad, since we know he's looking for you, what we want to do is we want to put you in the middle of a parking lot and use you as a decoy. This way we can lure him out. I said, excuse me, it's going to be a headshot. You're not going to know which way the bullet is coming from. I said, we're just trying to help you out. And I hung up the phone. So while you were here, I'm trying to put the timeline together. So you, you came here, your children were still in Antigua. Correct or wherever. I didn't know where so, they were at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and what, when was that? That's right. January 2001 January. is when I came here. So you're still trying to get your children back. And how was it that you knew that they were in Antigua and you said you went to court? You found out that that's where they were? Yes, when I was August of 2001. The shelter that I was in, in Tacoma, Washington, called and said they found my children, but the detective did. And I called him and he said, you need to fly back here for an emergency custody hearing, which is what we talked about earlier. So I went there, got the children, came back here, went into hiding. So from, two, so from September 2001 until September 2002, it was all about making sure my children were safe, that we were, I find a job, trying to get housing and things like that. So then in September 2002 or early October 2002, as you said, you were sort of in a much more heightened, heightened way absorbing the news of what was happening just like the rest of us. Tell me about that. So the first shooting rang out and I think it was um, Maybe early October is when, every, when they started taking it seriously, that it was gonna be, a, seemed to be a serial thing happening. And so it was about me talking to my children. Hey, if, then if you see anything suspicious, let me know. Do you, are you guys okay? Walking them to the bus stop at the same time, looking around to make sure I'm not being pursued. So October 11th, a co-worker convinced me to allow her to pick me up to bring me to work. I'm still at Southern Maryland Hospital. And so when I get in the car, she said, you know, there's a dark colored car outside your cul-de-sac. I'm getting a real bad feeling about that car. I said, yeah, girl, it's okay, let's just go to work. So we passed by the car the driver looks at us, but the passenger has a newspaper, and as we're passing by the car, he raises the paper up so we can't see him. And I said, did you see that? She said, yeah. I said, give me your phone. So I called 911. I said, there's a dark-colored Caprice or Impala with New Jersey plates, two African-American males seated outside the car, seated in the car. And she said, okay, we'll, we'll get somebody over there to investigate. So that's where we're gonna leave it for today. Later in this podcast series, the second half of my conversation with Mildred Muhammad, including her recollection of the night that the FBI came knocking on her door. You also heard her talk about October 11th, seeing that creepy vehicle outside her townhouse. When you go back through the timeline and you look, the dates match up, October 11th, that was the day that Kenneth Bridges was shot in Spotsylvania, Virginia. He was one of three people 
shot and killed that second week, including Dean Myers at the uh, Sunoco gas station that's still there in Manassas on 234, and also Iron Brown, who was the 13-year-old shot on October 7th outside his middle school in Prince George's County. In our next episode, you're going to hear from Iron. I've had a, a long conversation with him. Uh, he talks about that time, how he's doing now, and uh, I hope you find that compelling as well. So don't forget to check out our podcast on all your podcast platforms. You can also find it on fox5dc.com and also on YouTube on our Fox 5 channel. I'm really enjoying seeing everyone's comments, so please check it out. Leave a comment. Thanks so much.